With a Tycon flow snap, vivid like the Nikon. Been cold with the vibe warm. Keep it locked like the vice arm. They got her twisted like the coat arm. Heart something froze like the snowstorm. Her toe bag matched the throat charm. She from the land of the sand where they flex so subtle when a drink. Mint muddle left home in her man. In the game that he played for the sand of the shade. She parades you to square in her shades. She like why you do that. Niggas be deceptive. Young, pretty restless. Long as a check is addressed to a residence. She sell pill therapy. She beats in on clearance, but she shopping for clarity. Reap what she sold for the dividend. No time is a medicine. Copping the wristwatch. Cartier with the bezel on the credit. The man in hers webbers do. I swear she. She's so sadistic. Defensive, pessimistic, reclusive She too lit, independent She too quick to dismiss courtship Concerned with malice She pile up as the bout ends She throws a talent She clutch a half full chalice If you from fountains Check her rap, she sick Maneuver mountains, I My mind is racing, looking miles a minute No time to slide, I guess I'm bad with distance I never text you back, lately my thoughts, they drifted Around the shots to keep us all from losing Who we are, we're products of a generation We'll be swiping left across the interfaces All my mind, I tend to be evasive Yeah Self 
Yo, 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 what up, y'all? It's your boy Rob coming back at you once again with another live stream. So before we get started, you already know what to do. If you're not subscribed to the channel, make sure you hit the bell icon twice. Smash the like button, share this video out to all of your followers, and let's get it cracking. All right, so shout out to everybody who was in the building early. I know it's early as hell. And I'm shocked that people was in here, but shout out to y'all, man. It's good to see y'all in here. I appreciate y'all being here. If y'all can hear me okay, please give me a thumbs up or a radiation emoji in the chat. If you guys cannot hear me, please give me a thumbs down or an angry face. And while you guys are doing that, I'm going to shout out everybody who's in the building early, all right? We got Key Prince in the house. We got Crew Reality. We got Karen Dorsey. We got Patricia Slade. Shout out to Brooklyn Queen. We got Black Free Thinker in the building. We got New York State of Mind. Make sure y'all throw some radiation emojis, some ducks, flames in the chat for the off-rip ducats from New York State of Mind 22. Definitely appreciate it, bro. We got Carlton Way in the building. Shout out to you. We got John Guillory in the house. What's good with it, bro? And we got Black Spider and Savion Draco Zero. What's good with y'all? It's good to see each and every one of y'all. So I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can, but I got a feeling I'm not going to be able to do that because it's a lot of information. But it's some interesting information, and this isn't anything based on current events, although you know how it is. For the most part, as long as you're alive, everything is current. You know what I'm saying? So we need some chat room participation on this one, all right? Y'all know that I rock with horror movies real heavy. I really enjoy horror movies. It's one of my favorite things. Half the time when y'all don't be getting streams, it's because your boy is posted, you know what I'm saying, watching a horror movie. So I was watching this movie called A House of a Thousand Corpses. How many people ever heard of that movie called A House of a Thousand Corpses? It's by Rob Zombie. Rob Zombie made a couple horror movies. If I'm not mistaken, he made a couple remixes of the uh, Michael Myers Halloween series. If you guys have ever seen or heard of that movie, House of a Thousand Corpses, give me a thumbs up in the chat. If you guys have never heard of it, give me a thumbs down. Now, if you haven't heard of it, right, if you haven't, if you wanted a thumbs down, people, if you got Tubi, you could watch that movie and other great movies on Tubi. <laughs> that movie is on Tubi. And then uh, there is another movie on Tubi. Uh, let me let me see. Hold on real quick. I'm trying to remember what the name of that movie is. That's on uh, that's on Tubi. Yeah, the, the, the other one is a sequel. It's called The Devil's Rejects. How many people ever heard of the Devil's Rejects? If you guys ever heard of the Devil's Rejects, give me a thumbs up. If you guys haven't, give me a thumbs down. Now, here's the interesting thing, right? This is what I be telling people. Shout out to Kid Gravity. What's good with it, bro? It's important, man. It is important. This is how dangerous and how much of a weapon you can make Hollywood. I'm going to need y'all to really follow me on this on this right here. All right. Shout out to uh, Jada Informant. What's good with it, bro? Now, if anybody was aware, that last stream that I did, just so y'all know, it got yellow dollar sign. That's why it's on members only. So, you know what I'm saying? Anybody that wanted to see that last live stream that I did, it's on members only. And the only reason it's on members only is because it got yellow dollar sign. All right. So. How many people are familiar with the fictional town of Ruggsville, Texas. If you ever heard of the fictional town Ruggsville, Texas, give me a thumbs up. If you guys haven't, then give me a thumbs down. All right. We're going to do a little bit of background information on House of a Thousand Corpses. All right. Just so y'all know, Ruggsville, Texas is the place where House of a Thousand Corpses took place. All right. So if somebody in the comment section could be as kind as to Google, Ruggsville, Texas, and let us know what the first thing that the search engine brings back in the comment section. That would be great. And while y'all are doing that, I'm going to read this. All right. House of a Thousand Corpses is a 2003 American black comedy horror film written, co-star, co-scored and directed by Rob Zombie and his directional debut and was the first film in the Firefly film series. Now, here go my question for y'all. Do you know who the Firefly, the Firefly family is? 
that's another that's another one keep that in your head the firefly family all right it stars sid haig bill mosley sherry moon karen black rain wilson chris hardwick tom tolls aaron daniels jennifer jocelyn walton goggins and dennis fimple and in his final role the plot centers on a group of teenagers who are kidnapped and tortured by a psychotic family during Halloween after traveling across the country to write a book. All right. Now, mind you, remember, this is fiction, allegedly. Right. Shout out to New York State of Mind. New York, New York State of Mind says serial killer family with no limit to their evil misgivings, only mortality taking root in the depth of their shared depravity yeah facts facts that's what one of the articles says that's how one of the articles describes them right inspired by the 1970 horror films such as texas chainsaw massacre and the hills have eyes zombie convinced conceived the film while designing a haunted house attraction for universal studios hollywood where filming took place in 2000 on the back lots and in Valencia, California. When the studio shelved the film, fearing that it would receive an N17 rating, Zombie reacquired the rights. They were eventually sold to Lion Gates Entertainment, who released the film in April of 2003. Despite receiving an unfavorable response from its critics, it went on to grow $16 million worldwide. Since its release, the film has achieved a cult following and was developed into a haunted house attraction by Zombie for Universal Studios and was followed by two sequels, The Devil's Rejects that came out in 2005 and Three from Hell that came out in 2019. Now, here goes my question. How many people have heard of or seen any one of those movies? If you guys have ever heard of or seen either of those movies that we just mentioned, give me a thumbs up. If you guys have not, then give me a thumbs down. All right. On October 30th of 1977, amateur criminals Killer Carl and Richard Wick attempted an armed robbery at a gas station slash horror museum, but are deleted by the owner, Captain Spaulding, and his assistant, Ravelli. Later that night, Jerry Goldsmith, Bill Hoodley, Mary Knowles, and Denise Willis are on the road in hopes of writing a book on the offbeat roadside attractions. When the four met Spaulding, who was the owner of the Museum of Monsters and Mad Men, they learned of the local legend of Dr. Satan. All right. So now remember the Firefly family. All right. And remember Dr. Satan, because we're going to come back to those. All right. We're going to come back to those and shout out to New York State of Mind. How we're going to get to we're going to get to that. New York State of Mind, drop some jewels in the comment section. The Bender family, more well known as the Bloody Benders, were a family of serial killers in Labatt County, Kansas, United States, from May 1871 to December of 1772. Now, let me ask you guys this question. How many people have ever heard of or know anything about the Bender family? Because, see, there's a lot of families that tie into this situation here if you guys have ever heard of or know anything about the bender family give me a thumbs up if you guys don't know anything about the bender family or haven't heard of the bender family then give me a thumbs down the bender family yeah just remember that shout out to key prince what you know about the benders anybody that know anything about the benders let me know in the comment section all right so now here it says, as they take off in search of the tree from which Dr. Satan was allegedly hanged, they pick up a young free-spirited hitchhiker named Baby, who claims to live only a few miles away. Shortly after, a mysterious figure appears hidden in some overgrowth and shoots out their vehicle's tire with a shotgun. The group thinks that it's just a blown out tire, and so Baby takes Bill to her family's house, all right? to her family's house to get a tow truck. Now, mind you, the family house is the Firefly family. Moments later, 
baby's half brother rufus picks up the stranded passengers and takes them to the family home and again this family home is the firefly family home all right there they meet baby's family her adopted brother otis driftwood her deformed giant half brother tiny mother Fly firefly and grandpa hugo all right so now these are important why are they important they're important because this entire movie premise is based on real events now why is that important to us this is important to us because we could trace this family that this movie is based on back to some very interesting american ideals first and foremost what i always tell you all about the horror movies right the horror movies are based on the rural and suburban experience neatly packaged into a entertaining story for you to watch and digest and for them to make more money off of more money off of okay so that's the basic premise of the house of a thousand corpses all right so now next what we're going to do is we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the quote unquote firefly family and remember shout out to new york state of mind the firefly the firefly family is a family that is based on the actual bender family okay so now, this right here talks about the Firefly family, all right? And the Firefly family is the family that the movie 1000, House of a Thousand Corpses, The Devil's, uh, whatever that whatever that was, The Devil's Something, and uh, what that other, the trilogy, the third movie is based on. The Firefly family is a clan of loosely related individuals who existed as brutal, violent serial deleters in the town of Ruggsville, Texas, throughout the 1970s. Their actual surnames are unknown. They began using the, fly, the Firefly alias at the suggestion of a man who called himself Otis B. Driftwood. All of the family members, including Otis, adopted aliases based upon the film characters originally portrayed by the comedian Groucho Marx. The Firefly name came from a character named Rufus T. Firefly from the 1933 Duck Soup film, all right? Now, my question for you guys is, how many people ever heard of that? If you guys heard of that, give me a thumbs up. If you guys didn't, give me a thumbs down. Now, shout out to New York State of Mind. New York State of Mind says, True Detective's first season was based on the Firefly family. Now, this Firefly family got a real interesting history, and so does quote unquote this this place in texas rugsville that's allegedly a fictional place right but rugsville texas is actually based on a real place that's called deadwood how many people ever heard of deadwood texas if you ever heard of deadwood texas give me a thumbs up if you guys haven't heard of deadwood texas then give me a thumbs down Now, some interesting stuff went on in Deadwood, Texas, and we're going to talk about it, all right? Because remember, Texas is one of the homes of Juneteenth, right? Very important. The Firefly family is a clan of loosely related individuals who existed as brutal, violent serial deleters in the town of Ruggsville, Texas throughout the 1970s. Their actual surnames are unknown. They began using the Firefly alias at the suggestion of a man who called himself Otis B. Driftwood. All of the family members, including Otis, adopted aliases based upon film characters originally portrayed by comedian Groucho Marx. The Firefly name came from a character named Rufus T. Firefly from the 1933 film Duck Soup. Now, let me ask you guys a question about that name, Rufus. What's that sound like to you? Did that name sound familiar or sound interesting or sound like something you ever heard before? If it does, let me know where you might have heard it from, all right? Now, 
Here it says the eldest member of the group was a man affectionately known as Grandpa Hugo. Very little is known about this individual, save that he is likely the father of Eve Wilson, who had since adopted the nickname Mother Firefly. It is believed that Grandpa Hugo may have had some connection to a psychotic surgeon named Dr. Quentin Quayle, who carved himself legendary, legendary status under the pseudonym Dr. Satan. Some sources suggest that Hugo may have actually been Dr. Satan, while others asserted that he masqueraded as him on occasion. All right. Eve Wilson, a.k.a. Mother Firefly, was a former prostitute who had sired children through various fathers. One of these men, presumably named Rufus, gave her son, who was known as Rufus Firefly Jr., another man, Earl, who may have been Eve's common-law husband, was the father of Tiny. When Tiny was a young boy, Earl suffered a psychotic break, poured gasoline on his son, and set him on fire. Tiny survived, but suffered third degree burns over his entire body. Now, that sounds like what was about to be an attempted familicide, right? Would you guys agree? If if you guys would agree, that sounds like it was about to be the start of an a, a, attempted familicide. Give me a thumbs up. If not, give me a thumbs down. And as you guys know, right now, we're still in the realms of fiction. All right. We're st we haven't made it to outside of the realms of fiction of fiction yet. OK. So. Now, I think that that's enough background information. About the Firefly family. All right. Now what we about to do is start moving into some geographical information, because the geographical information is what is really interesting. All right. Ruggsville, Texas. Now, remember, Ruggsville is a fictional town. It's the fictional town where House of a Thousand Corpses took place. All right. Here we go right here. Ruggsville is a fictional city located in Ruggsville County, Texas. It is the primary setting of the 2003 horror film House of 1000 Corpses and its 2005 sequel, The Devil's Rejects. During the 1970s, Ruggsville was the scene of a string of bizarre, violent murders perpetuated by the Firefly family. All right. So, again, remember, Ruggsville, the Firefly family, so far, all of this is fiction. This is all horror movie stuff, right? So then they go down and they give a you know a couple of little landmarks and different things like that that they talk about in the movie. Now we get to Deadwood, Texas. Deadwood has a very interesting history. All right. And we're going to talk about the history of Deadwood, Texas briefly. All right. Deadwood, Texas. Deadwood previously known as Linus, is an unincorporated community in Panola County, Texas, United States. All right. Question. How many people are familiar with Panola County, Texas? If there's anybody in here that's familiar with Panola County, Texas, give me a thumbs up. If you're not familiar with Panola County, Texas, then give me a thumbs down. And real quick, shout out to everybody that's watching. I appreciate y'all. We got 24 people watching and we got 17 likes. If everybody could get the likes to 30, that'd be great. Also, if you guys haven't shared the stream, take a moment, share the stream. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, make sure y'all hit that, that bell icon twice. All right. The community is located at the intersection of Farm to Market Road 31 and Farm to Market Road 2517, about 10 miles east, east of Carthage. All right. The area was first settled in 1837. Now, OK, they're calling this settled. The area was first settled in 1837 by Adam Legrone and his family, who built a homestead not far from Sacagee Creek after they were granted about 10,000 acres from the Mexican government. Now, let me ask you guys this question. Let's start here. How do you just get granted 10,000 acres from the Mexican government? How does that work? And let me ask you guys this question. Is there anybody in you all's family that you can trace back who was granted 10,000 10, acres of land from any government? 
All right. So remember this name, Adam Lagorn. OK, the area was first settled in 1837 by Adam Lagorn. Now, let me ask you guys this question. Were your relatives or ancestors who were alive back then allowed to buy, receive or own land? If they were, give me a thumbs up. If they were not, then give me a thumbs down. So then we got to ask this question. How did the Lagorn family get the land? How did the Lagorn family get the land? How do you just get 10,000 acres from the Mexican government? Deadwood was the first community east of Sabine River in Panola County. Men of the Lagorn family fought in the Texas Revolution, the Regulator Moderator War, and the Civil War. Now, let me ask you guys this question What's the Regulator Moderator War? But they fought in the Civil War. Now, they were in Deadwood, Texas. What side on the Civil War do you think that they fought on? If these people were if if these people were in Texas, what side of the Civil War did they fight on? Who were they fighting for? After the end of the Civil War, a grandson of Adam, Confederate veteran Hiram Clark Lagorn built a mill and a gin that became the nucleus of the later town. And if you do more research, you will find out that this mill and gin was a cotton gin. Okay. This mill and gin was a cotton gin. The Lagorn family, look at this. The Lagorn family still owns much of the original land grant and comprises most of the membership of Deadwood's two churches, the Deadwood Methodist Church and the Deadwood Pentecostal Church. Now, let me ask you guys this. Is there anybody in your families that got land back in the 1800s and still owns that land today? So now let me ask you all this. People always say this about how does this stuff affect anybody that's alive today? Let me ask you guys this question. Would any of what went on in 1800 have affected the Lagorn family? They're still alive today, and guess what? They still own it. They still own it. So now here it says the Reverend Charlie and Clara Alexander Lagorn Family Community Center adjoins the Deadwood Methodist Church. Locally, two Lagorn men, direct descendants of the Deadwood's founder, sit on the commissioner's court of Panola County. Now, they have descendants of the person who founded the city or the person who, you know, organized the city, they're still serving as commissioners of the court. Is that a coincidence? If that's a coincidence, then give me a thumbs up. If that's not a coincidence, then give me a thumbs down. The small settlement was originally known as Linus, but when residents applied for a post office in 1882, another town already had that name, and the new name, Deadwood, was chosen at a town meeting. A family burial ground was begun on the Lagorn farm in 1847 when Adam Lagorn's wife, Christina, died. Adam was buried next to his wife nine years later. Although the land did not officially appear in county deeds, records as a public cemetery until 1859 members of the community were buried here before that time a testament to early panola county history the deadwood cemetery is still in use and maintained by the descendants of the quote-unquote pioneer families now let me ask you guys this question how many of you are able to trace your family back to your direct descendants like a lagorn That's my question. And you guys are going to see why I'm asking this question in a minute. All right. By 1855, Deadwood had an estimated population of 50, two churches, a district school, and a steam cotton gin and grist mill. A hotel was built there around 1900, but went out of business a few years later. The local post office was discontinued in 1917. See, now now we're getting to, we're we're getting to that part of time that affects people that are alive today. 
Now we're getting to the time periods that affect people who are alive today. But remember, this stuff don't affect anybody that's alive today. In the mid 1930s, Deadwood had a church, a school and two stores. It reported its reported population in 1936 was 125. After World War II, the community school was consolidated with the Carthage District and the remaining businesses at Deadwood closed. In 1990, Deadwood was a dispersed rural community with a reported population of 106. The population remained unchanged until 2000. OK. So now. In the house, I want you guys to see this down here in. In the house of 1,000 corpses, the fictional town of Rug Rugsville is located near Deadwood. The fictional town of Rugsville is located near Deadwood. Okay. So, Rugsville is related to Deadwood. All right. Now, we're going to take a look at that family called the Lagorn family, right? This is a this right here is a genealogy of the Lagorn family. This also shows the slave the slaves that the Lagorns owned. So we're going to skip down here to Texas. All right. Adam Lagorn didn't we talk about an Adam Lagorn just a second ago? If we didn't talk about an Adam Lagorn just a second ago, give me a thumbs, give me a thumbs down. We literally just talked about Adam Lagorn, didn't we? Adam Lagorn had two slaves. He had a black female and a male mulatto slave. W. M. A. Lagorn had one black female slave who was 14. Okay. So these Lagorns in Texas, they own some slaves. Okay. Shout out to Torian. What's good with it, bro? These Lagorns in Texas, they own they own some slaves. Now, I don't know if this has anything to do with the Lagorn family, but I found this interesting. And I don't know, people may not have heard about this, right? But there was an article that came out from KHOU 11 News, and this says descendants of a Texas slave owner, enslaved woman, claimed to seek land supposedly left to her 150 plus years ago. All right. KHOU 11 traveled to Jacksonville in Cherokee County, Texas, to find out more about the family's mission. Now, let me ask you guys this question. What do you all think has been done about this? What do y'all think has been done about this? If y'all think that anything has been done about this, then give me a thumbs up. If y'all don't think that anything has been done about it, then give me a thumbs down. We're about to listen to this real quick. Cousins with Texas roots were astounded by a genealogy search, finding out they may be entitled to land apparently left to their enslaved ancestors, land those ancestors never actually received. Jason Miles traveled east to Jackson. So how did they not? Let's start there. How did these enslaved ancestors never receive this land? What ended up happening? What happened? How did they not receive the land? And here's the question. Did the Lagrange's enslaved ancestors or did the Lagrange's slave descendants or slaves receive anything that was related to them? Now, let me ask you guys this question. If we go back and check out all of these stories of these deeds and wills and land grants that slave owners gave to their slaves, how many people do y'all think actually got the land or got what was supposed to be given to them? And if they didn't get it, then where did it go? Shout out to AB Promotions. AB Promotions said, Rob, you think he impregnated the woman and the mulatto was his son? That's a possibility. Shout out to you, bro. Good to see you. So my thing is that is there's any black people that got the last name Lagorn? They should look into this Lagorn family. Now, 
Let's continue to check this out right here. Cousins with Texas roots were astounded by a genealogy search, finding out they may be entitled to land apparently left to their enslaved ancestors, land those ancestors never actually received. Jason Miles traveled east to Jacksonville, Texas in Cherokee County to learn more about this story. From tiny tomatoes on street signs to concrete tomatoes on sidewalks, Jacksonville's tomato capital of the world nickname goes back a long time, as does this city's history. The area's fertile land may have drawn Albardus Arnwine here from Tennessee nearly two centuries ago. He died before both the Civil War and Jacksonville's official founding in 1872. I um, took the ancestry DNA test and I discovered what happened. It was just unbelievable candace hammonds now here go my question for y'all why shout out to shamika by the way what's good with it, shamika why are there so few black people so few because these are legit undeniable i mean if this ain't a certification of what a foundational black american is i don't know what else is but here's the question why are these records so sparsely di dis dispersed why is it so difficult for people to find this kind of stuff if you ask me, it should literally be easy for us to find all of this kind of stuff. And then the thing that people need to link it back to is what happened to the transfer of ownership? Would you guys agree? What happened to the transfer of ownership? And real quick, shout out to everybody that's watching. I appreciate you guys. We got 31 people watching. Shout out to all 31 of y'all. I definitely appreciate y'all being here. And we got 23 likes. If everybody can bang on that like button and get us to 50, that would be great. If y'all haven't shared, make sure y'all share. If y'all not subscribed and you're new to the channel, welcome. Make sure you subscribe and say what's up. All right, let's get it. Claims to be the great, great, great granddaughter of an enslaved woman named Gracie, with whom Arnwine, her white slaveholder, had children and to whom old records. See, so now that's that right there. That right there is exactly, for one, right, we could go back and talk about Sonny Hostin, because that's probably how Sonny Hostin got her slave owner DNA, you know what I'm saying? And then also, we can talk about the fact that a lot of these, like AB Promotions was saying, a lot of these slaves were, were children of the slave master listed as, as slaves, as if they were purchased, all right? Jacksonville's official founding in 1872. I um, took the ancestry DNA test and I discovered what happened. It was just unbelievable. Candace Hammonds claims to be the great, great, great granddaughter of an enslaved woman named Gracie, with whom Arnwine, her white slaveholder, had children and to whom old. So now they keep saying supposedly and that she claimed, but they got all these PDF documents with the actual receipts on it. <laughs> so. Make that make sense. Records and this grandson's oral history suggest Arnwine left hundreds of acres. His family and his neighbors were not, um, did not approve. Now, this, this is going to take us into our next segment, right? This is going to take us into our next segment because here's the question that we got to ask. I need y'all to tell me in the comment section, if y'all know, where did they get this land from? Shout out to New York State of Mind. New York State of Mind said they might be related to Toby and Harriet. They could be. They could be. Here goes my question for y'all. Where did these families, the Lagorn family and whatever family that these people are related to, where did they get their land from? How did they get all this land? We got to figure out the source of the distribution where they were given some land. Okay. Of his relationship with Gracie, because she did live in a house with him um, as basically his mistress. Mary Tucker is another descendant now immersed in the story and pushing this online petition. Hammond started to try and potentially fulfill a will that was never honored. These were court systems and legal systems that were heavily prejudiced against African Americans, either enslaved or recently emancipated. Dr. Nicholas Crawford is an assistant history professor at Sam Houston State University who's writing a book on slavery. He says neither intimate relationships between slaveholders and the enslaved were unheard of, nor the bequeathment of land, adding that some relationships in the antebellum South 
may have been more nuanced than we tend to think. And as this case shows, um, no, not that we tend to think, not that, not that we tend to think, than what white people and what non-black people tend to think. And actually, they don't tend to think this stuff. They literally just purposely ignore verifiable, objective reality. Would you guys agree? If you guys agree, give me a thumbs up. If y'all disagree, give me a thumbs down. The kind of family lore and oral transmission um, of the conditions of slavery and agreements between um, slaveholders and, and slave people can pass down um, through family trees and still shape the legacies um, of society today. Neither Hammonds nor Tucker, who live in Phoenix and Los Angeles, respectively, have ever been to Jacksonville or Cherokee County. According to old maps, the landed question lied along the Natchez River, but a lot of it may... So now here goes my question. Shout out to Deneen. What's good with it, Deneen? With all of these in-depth records of who owned slaves, where is the records of the slave ships that these people came from? They got all of these in-depth records, all of these manifests, all of these inventories. Where are the inventories and manifests of the quote-unquote ships, the receipts of purchase? Where is all of this stuff? They now be underwater thanks to Lake Jacksonville's construction in the 1950s. So far, family members do not have legal representation to help wade through complicated records and right a potential wrong, but it's something they're exploring. It's something they're exploring. So they're doing a study. They're doing a study. Now, let me ask you guys this. I bet you the family that owned them slaves got enough money for an attorney, don't they? Right. How is it that they got records of all the, all the slaves, but they don't have records of the slave ships? Facts, Carlton. You've seen all those PDF files that they had, and none of these places say where they got these slaves from, where they get them from. We basically want to share this and give our support from everyone, the world and um, government officials. We want to turn an injustice into a justice. In Cherokee County, Texas, Jason Miles, KHOU 11 News. Now, let me ask you guys this question. How common do you think that a story like that is to any quote unquote foundational black American? Is that a pretty common story? Is that a pretty common theme or no? Nah? Shout out to Sun Kissed by the Most High. What's good with it? So now, fast forward, right? Oh, you thought we was done. We're not done yet. You guys remember just a couple seconds ago, we was talking about the quote unquote Bender family. Now, shout out to New York State of Mind because New York State of Mind put it in the comments who the Bender family are, right? The Bender family is a family that is a real family, which is who the family, the Firefly family from the fictional town of Ruggsville, who was actually based on the town of Deadwood, is based on. Shout out to Key Prince. Key Prince says, not as many so-called slave ships. We were here already. Facts. Facts. Now, this story takes an interesting twist, all right? The, the, the movie, The House of 1000 Corpses, is based on the Firefly family that lived in Ruggsville, Texas, a psychotic serial killing family. The second movie in that trilogy is called The Devil's Rejects, still based on the Firefly family. These are the real life Devil's Rejects right here, all right? We're going to talk about it. Rob Zombie's critically acclaimed masterpiece, The Devil's Rejects, is the far superior sequel to the equally gut-wrenching and terrifying House of 1000 Corpses. The pair of gore flicks 
follows the Fireflies, a serial killer family with no limits to their evil misgivings, their only mortality taking root in the depth of their shared depravity. All right. However, the Firefly family from the Devil's Rejects is just pure fiction since a set of real life serial killer parents who worked alongside their dangerous son and daughter could not possibly exist in the real world, right? Unfortunately, while the Fireflies are confined to the silver screen, their real life counterparts, the Bender family, known widely as the Bloody Benders, did in fact exist, terrorizing Cherryville, Kansas from 1869 through 1872. Now, let me ask you guys this question. If this family was doing all of this stuff to white people, what do you think they did to black people? Shout out to Finally Aware. What's good with it? If this family did all of this to white people, my question for y'all is, what do you think that they what do you think that they did to black people? The Bloody Benders were a small, outwardly quiet family who ran an inn on the outskirts of Cherryville that was open to all travelers and was equipped with a dining area, a warm bed, a barn and corral for animals, as well as a two acre garden and orchard. The people of Cherryville and the Benders visitors regarded the family wearily since they seemed to have an oddness about them. Now, let me ask you guys this question. What kind of oddness do you guys think that they had about them? What kind of an oddness do y'all think that they had about them? They said that this family had like a little bit of a weirdo type vibe to them. They had a little bit of a weird streak. What kind of weirdness, what kind of oddness do y'all think that they had? John Bender Sr. and his wife Elvira, anybody ever heard of an Elvira before? Kept to themselves most of the time and barely spoke English. They barely spoke English. They barely spoke English. Here, uh oh, wait a minute. How did they barely speak English? If they didn't speak English, then what language did they speak? Wait a minute. Are you telling are you telling me that this psychotic all-American foundational W American family was some undocumented bros? Was they some OG undocumented bros? John Bender Sr. and his wife Elvira kept to themselves most of the time and barely spoke English preferring their native tongue of German. Shout out again to in, uh, New York State of Mind. But their children, John Bender Jr. and his sister Kate, were more sociable. John Jr. and Kate, often spotted in Sunday school at the local church, were the ones to charm the visitors upon first arrival at the end, which set the guests at ease. And then what happened? Like the Firefly clan in The Devil's Rejects, the bloody benders had dual personalities and their sinister dynamic worked underneath their happy exterior of family togetherness and entrepreneurship. When select guests would join the family for dinner, for instance, they would take the seat of honor that was situated in front of a curtain, which divided the living space and the dining area. The guest of honor would be graced with the delightful presence of Kate and her lively conversation, as well as John senior, John Jr. or John Sr. sneaking up behind him with a hammer and striking the visitor on the head until they were dead. Now, here goes my question. What would motivate somebody to do something like that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And here and shout out to Key Prince. That's not just an assumption. We're going to actually verify that momentarily. We're going to we're going to actually verify that momentarily. OK. A, a trap door 
which was expertly placed underneath the feet of the guest would then open and their dead body would be whisked downstairs into the basement to be dismembered and buried in a shallow grave in the family orchard soon after. The guests that were deleted were not even rich or had anything of valuable to them. So it is highly likely that the Bender family, like the Fireflies, deleted for the sheer thrill and love of it. Now, let me ask you guys this question. If you ask me, the only way that they could have possibly deleted this many people and didn't get in trouble for it is if a large majority of the people that they deleted were black. Or another thing that I wouldn't be surprised about is I wouldn't be surprised if they lured runaway slaves to their hotel for safety and harbor and did did something crazy to them. It's a possibility, New York State of Mind. It's definitely a possibility. Okay. So, so now here it says during their escapades, which totaled 11 homicides, John Jr. and Kate were also involved in a bizarre incestuous relationship. So now shout out to Torian because Torian said something about maybe because the family seemed like they was people from the hills have eyes. There you go. That that verifies it. That validates it because the family was largely involved into an incestuous relationship. Shout out to my man, John Guillory. John Guillory said, I'm just catching up with the stream. I saw these Rob Zombie movies. I bet you he going to feel like he saw a ghost when he gets to this part of the stream. <laughs> and real quick, shout out to everybody that's in here, man. I appreciate y'all. We got 37 people watching. Shout out to y'all. If y'all haven't smashed that like button yet, let's smash that like button. Try to get the likes. Where we at? Let me see. Try to get the likes. We got 38 people watching and 31 likes. Let's try to get the likes to 50. And if you guys haven't shared the stream, wherever you're watching from, take a moment, do that, help out. That would definitely be appreciated. That had neighbors believing that they were husband and wife rather than sister and brother. But interestingly, they were both. Okay. It wasn't until early 1873 that suspicion around aroused in Cherryville after a prominent doctor of the area, William York, never made it home after last being seen in the care of the benders. All right. So now you guys notice somebody of notoriety went there and ended up disappearing and they noticed it very quickly. But they was allowed to get away with these 10 other homicides and nobody really paid any attention to it. So who do you think that they were knocking off as they came through? See, that's the, that's the real trivia question. Dr. York had a brother who also happened to be a colonel that arrived on the scene with the plethora of his men in the tow. After a couple of days of investigating, Colonel York held a town meeting where he announced that he would be searching every home in the area. Unfortunately, the benders had got wind of what was transpiring and fled before the search even began. But luckily, some people found the 11 shallow graves that would become the Bender's legacy. While many were men that appeared to be traveling, one of the victims was a young girl, guessed to be about eight years of age, who was found buried alive. One of her arms was broken and a single leg was pulled out of the socket, which is wild. All right. So now here go the question. Whatever happened to the Bender family, y'all? Whatever happened to these people? Where did the Bender family go? Yeah, shout out to J.D. Informant. J.D. Informant says, what a legacy. If you guys think that this was a great pick for Jesse Lee Peterson's White History Month, give me a thumbs up. If you guys don't think that it was a good pick, then give me a thumbs down. I think that every individual that we've discussed should have their own segment on the JLP show as far as, you know, W History Month. So now here it says, not only dope, Doe, the Firefly clan from the Devil's Rejects and the Bender family parallel each other in their murderous schemes and terrible nefarious methods, they also share other bizarre characteristics. For instance, the blatant disregard of human life in exchange for their own sick pleasure of deleting something is something that is lavished by both families. Likewise, the amount of deception involved. 
which is showcased by each set of children, exemplifies their values to their treacherous kin, given their ability to manipulate regular people. OK. Although Kate did distract guests before their death, she made the end popular by posting false claims of being a doctor, which is where they got the idea of Dr. Satan from and a psychic around the town. She would invite the vulnerable to be, quote unquote, healed. But some of these people instead received the unfortunate fate of blunt force trauma. Similarly, Otis and Baby Firefly fooled hotels guests in the Devil's Rejects so that they could gain access to other rooms where they ultimately toyed with innocent people before deleting them like animals. OK. So now, see, this this is allegedly one of the weapons that she used to delete people. Professor Miss Kate Bender. This is one of the uh, this is one of the artifacts, like an old like poster from their hotel, June eighteenth of eighteen seventy two. Okay, June eighteenth of eighteen seventy two. So now here it says, furthermore, under duress. And being discovered by law enforcement, both families fled. But while the fireflies were caught and deleted, the real family, the Bloody Benders, mysteriously disappeared. And their fate is still unknown to this day. Now, here goes my question for y'all. How did they disappear and where did they disappear to? Where'd they go? Where they at? Where these people at? Where'd they go? Although the Firefly family from the Devil's Rejects could be considered more terrifying since the possibility of real life counterparts exist, there is one positive adage. A family that deletes together seems to stay together. All right. That's what they say on this right here. All right. So now next, what we're going to do is we're going to talk deeply about the bloody benders. All right. So now, do you guys see how a horror movie is actually about something that took place in the rural area? Let me ask you guys this question. How many movies are they going to make about Chicago? And do you guys also see how this was a family tradition? Shout out to Patrick Taylor. And now you guys also see how degenerate this is. But look at how the money is made. If you guys agree with New York State of Mind, life imitates art, give me a thumbs up. If y'all disagree, then give me a thumbs down. Yeah, shout out to Torian. Chicago, uh, Candyman was about Chicago. Yeah, it was about Caprini Green. Shout out to Patrick. Patrick says the media is the most to blame for all this death and degeneracy. They are the ones who push this, narr this narrative of wholesome and good and then run interference for beasts like this with the mental excuse. Yeah, facts. And if you guys go back and check out some of my videos in the familicide playlist or surviving the suburbs, you will see that this is not uncommon. Not only is it uncommon, there is a historical legacy of this. There is a historical legacy of this. You know what I'm saying? The Bender family, more well known as the Bloody Benders, were a family of serial deleters in Labatt County, Kansas, United States, from May of 1871 to December of 1872. Now, let me ask you guys this question. How many black people do y'all think that this family probably got lynched by blaming some of their deletions and some of their degenerate acts on, on black people? You know, they probably got away with a lot of this stuff because they probably would have some random black person around and say, oh, that person did it. And of course, the entire town would be like, yeah, let's get them. The Bender family. Now, now check this out, right? Why is it that people can so easily say, well, how does this affect anybody that's alive today? While the very people that sit there and say, how does this affect anybody that's alive today? Those very people are literally making money off of this. All of the all of the well, how does this affect people that are alive today? People, 
are the people that put this into a film format and are making money off of this. You know what I'm saying? The family supposedly consisted of John Bender, his wife, Elvira, their son, John Jr., and their daughter, Kate. Contemporary newspaper accounts reported that the Bender's neighbors claimed that John Jr. and Kate were actually husband and wife, er, husband and wife, possibly a common law marriage. In 1890, Elvira Hill and her daughter, Miss Sarah Davis, both of Michigan, were charged for being Elvira and Kate Bender. They proved they were not and were released. Now, here goes my question. How did they prove that they weren't? How do you do that? How do you prove it either way? How do you prove that they are? And how do you prove that they aren't? Mind you, in 1890, without, you know, the advanced forensic technology that we supposedly have today. Estimates report that the benders deleted at least a dozen travelers and perhaps as many as 20 before they were discovered. The family's fate remains unknown, with theories ranging from a lynching to a successful escape. Much folklore and legend surround the benders, making it difficult to separate fact from fiction. Now, let me ask you guys this question. Is that actually urban legend or is this just a, con a, a, a convenient misinformation campaign? Yeah, I got to I got to agree. Shout out to Black Spider. If you guys agree with Black Spider, give me a thumbs up. If you all disagree with Black Spider, give me a thumbs down. Black Spider says lots of black people were used as scapegoats and deleted. Yeah. Facts. Facts. In October of 1870, five families of spiritualists homesteaded. All right? How do you do that? Let's let's picture this. Let's let's picture where all of this came from. All right. In October. Damn. Hold on real quick. My bad. In October of 1870. Right. I don't know why it's doing this. Hold on real quick. y'all. There we go. In October of 1870, five families of spiritualists homesteaded in and around the town of Osage in northern Labatt County, approximately seven miles north east of where Cherriesville was established seven months later. One of these families was John Bender and John Bender Jr. Look at this. Who registered 160 acres of land adjacent to the Great Osage Trail, the only open road for traveling further west. After a cabin, a barn with a corral, and a well were built, Elvira and Kate arrived in the fall of 1871. All right. So now here goes this question here. How did they get this land? Oh, yeah, facts. Shout out to Tammy. What's good with it, Tammy? And we haven't even got into it yet. We haven't even got into it yet. And see, shout out, shout out to Torian. Torian says, Osage, that's where the movie and book Killers of the Flower Moon took place. I wouldn't be surprised if that had something to do with this actual history of that town. Because I'm when I'm trying to tell y'all, man, these these hor these horror movies are are literal history. They just rearrange a bunch of stuff and create fictional characters to, to represent factual events. You know what I'm saying? The benders divided their cabin into two rooms with a canvas wagon cover. They used the smaller room at the rear living quarters and the front room as a general store where they sold dry goods. A crudely drawn misspelling sign reading grocery indicated a lack of familiarity with English. So again, we got to ask the question, why were these people unfamiliar with English? How is they unfamiliar with English? Shout out to Tori. See? Killers of the Flower Moon was a real story. Who needs fiction? Shout out to Patrick Taylor. Patrick says, Rob, I remember reading this story about this white dude from pre-civil rights era who was a serial killer. He got a few black men deleted, including a teen who was out to death. 
he eventually got caught. See? And shout out to shout out to Black Spider. Black Spider said they blame black people for everything all the time. When that doesn't work, they just straight up lie on us. And that's one of the reasons why I agree with Jesse Lee Peterson that there absolutely should be a white history month. And we're going to talk about all of the undocumentation. We're going to talk about all of the incest. And we're going to talk about all of the free handouts that people were given, like the Bender family. Because let me ask you guys this question. Y'all think that the Bender family got any handouts? If y'all think that the Bender family got any handouts, give me a thumbs up. If y'all don't, give me a thumbs down. The Benders divided their cabin with two rooms with a canvas wagon cover. They used the smaller room at the rear for living quarters and the front room as a general store where they sold dry goods. A crudely drawn misspelling sign reading groceries indicated a lack of familiarity with English. The front section also contained the kitchen and dining table where travelers could stop for a meal or spend the night. Elvira and Kate also planted a two acre vegetable garden an apple orchard north of the cabin. So you guys see the apple orchard? Remember that apple orchard, that's the same place where uh, Dr. Satan was allegedly hung at from the house of a thousand corpses. Uh -huh. I would bet that he, I would, I would agree too. Shout out to Tammy. If y'all agree with Tammy, give me a thumbs up. If y'all disagree, give me a thumbs down. Tammy said, I bet their real name wasn't Bender. I bet you they bought that name for $25. Facts, they might be some $5 Benders. You know what I'm saying? And shout out to Patrick. Patrick says, peep the write up, John Bender. He was 25 and quote unquote handsome. The media always does that. Facts. Or either he was some type of genius or some type of superhuman. Real quick, ladies and gentlemen, make sure y'all show AB promotion some love. Please throw some flames, radiation emoji, ducks in the chat from my man AB promotion, the second stream sponsor. Definitely appreciate you, bro. He says, wild. Yeah, this, this, this is wild. This is very wild. John Bender Sr. was around 60 years old and he spoke little English. The English he did speak was guttural and usually unintelligible. According to the May 23rd, 1873 edition of the Emporia News, he was identified with the name William Bender. Now, if you go back and look at this, quote unquote, guttural English, here's my question for everybody. What is, quote unquote, guttural English? Somebody look that up and put your definition of it in the comment section. Elvira Bender was 55 years old. She allegedly also spoke little English and was so unfriendly that her neighbors called her a quote unquote she devil. OK. Which is interesting. Right. Because when you say D, when you see when you say devil, right, devil is the word evil with an E in front of it, which is interesting because allegedly the word evil allegedly came from Eve, if you believe in that kind of thing. So really. You know, if you do like the linguistics of the words, you got to question a lot of stuff. John Bender Jr. was around 25 years old and handsome, allegedly. Like, shout out to what uh, Patrick Taylor just said. You see how they said that? He, now, how was he 25 years old and handsome? And they said that the family had incest features. John Bender was allegedly around 25 years old and handsome with an auburn hair and mustache. He spoke English fluently with a German accent. He was prone to laughing aimlessly, which led many to, quote unquote, consider him a, quote unquote, halfwit. Kate Bender, who was around 23, was cultivated and attractive. Uh, again, how do we know all this? And spoke English well with the little accent. Now, let me ask you guys this question. When they talk about old school black people, like when they talk about Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth, do they ever say that they were beautiful? Or, you know what I'm saying? Do they ever say how good they possibly looked? Or, you know what I'm saying? But these people are allegedly, you know, this is a alleged, quote unquote, 
similar to Hills Have Eyes type family, but they're sitting up here talking about how allegedly gorgeous and amazingly beautiful that these people were. Does it make sense? If that makes some sense, then give me a thumbs up. If it makes no sense whatsoever, then give me a thumbs down. If you ask me, no sense whatsoever is, is, is my vote. Okay. So now here it says a self-proclaimed healer and psychic. She distributed flyers advertising her alleged supernatural powers and her ability to cure illness. Now, back then, this is when they were burning witches. Right. But somehow she didn't end up getting burnt down. She distributed flyers advertising her supernatural powers and her ability to cure illness. She also conducted seances and gave lectures on, quote unquote, spiritualism for which she gained notoriety by advocating, quote unquote, free love. Kate's popularity became a large attraction for the Benders Inn. Although the elder Benders kept to themselves, Kate and her brother regularly attended Sunday school in the nearby Harmony Grove. The Benders were widely believed to be German immigrants. Okay, which, again, they would where else would they have gotten the German accent from? Shout out to them KJs. What's good with it, bro? Where else would they have gotten that German accent from? No documentation or definitive. So they're undocumented. No documentation or definitive proof of their relationships to one another or where they were born has ever been found. So again, un OG undocumented bros. John Bender Sr. was either from Germany, Norway, or the Netherlands, which th these are three very different places with very different migration patterns of the Americas, but whatever, and may have been born as, quote unquote, John Flickinger. According to contemporary newspapers, Elvira, born Elmira Hill Mark, often misported as Meek, in the Adrendak Mountains, she married Simon Mark, with whom she had 12 children. Later, she married William Stephen Griffith. Elvira was rumored to have deleted several husbands, but none of these rumors were ever proven. Kate purportedly Elvira's fifth daughter. Some of the Bender's neighbors claimed that John Jr. and Kate were not brother and sister, but husband and wife, which wouldn't be surprising. You know what I'm saying? That wouldn't be surprising. Now, again, there's a lot here, right, as far as the bloody benders goes, and you guys basically got the main idea, right? So we're going to go a little bit deeper in here, and we're going to look at a little bit more about this family, okay? Because, again, this family has got a lot of, they got a lot of interesting secrets, a lot of interesting secrets, the truth about the Bloody Benders serial deleter family. All right. So now look at this cabin. You guys notice is this a popular scene from a lot of horror movies? If you guys have ever seen like a picture that looks exactly like this in popular horror movies, give me a thumbs up. If you guys haven't, then give me a thumbs down. This is a pretty popular scene in horror movies, wouldn't you say? In October of 1870, the Bender family moved to a 160-acre plot of land in Labatt County, Oklahoma, as part of the Homestead Act of 1862. As part of the Homestead Act in 1862. Now, let me ask you guys this question. How many of you all's parents, grandparents, or great-grandparents was able to take advantage of the Homestead Act of 1862. And here's the question, why weren't they? So now they gave this psychotic, undocumented family 160 acres. Okay. 
I'm going to read this part again. In October of 1870, the Bender family moved to a 160-acre plot of land in Labatt County, Oklahoma, as part of the Homestead Act of 1862. Now, what I would like is I'd like every single politician to name each and every black person that was able to utilize the Homestead Act of 1862 and list all of them and the places of the land that they received. So now here's my question. They said that only poor people had that only rich people had slaves. Let me ask you guys this question. Did only rich people get to participate in the Homestead Act? Yeah, facts. Shout out to Carlton Way. Shout out to Jerry Beffert. What's good with it, bro? Carlton says the Homestead Act was one of the biggest handouts in American history. That's why so many white people own tons of land in the West. Facts. Facts. So now let me ask you guys this. Should we just not talk about it because this happened so long ago? Rob Zombie actually went through all this history and made a movie about it and made himself millions of dollars. But we'll be told that we shouldn't talk about this. The settlers included John Bender, his wife, Elvira, and their children. And let me ask you guys this. Where did the United States government get this land from in Oklahoma to be able to just give it away to immigrant families in 1862? Where where did all this come from? The settlers included John Bender, his wife Elvira, and their children, John Jr. and Kate. As reported by Crime Reports, it is unclear where the family originated. They are undocumented. Do, do, I want you guys to pay very close attention. You, you guys, when you see when I be making my little comments, or if y'all see me in a comment section and I make a crazy ass comment, what I be trying to tell y'all, and it's funny because I had just talked to my man TD yesterday. I'm believe it or not, I'm never trying to be funny. I'm never trying to be funny. It is unclear where the family originated. However, it is believed that they were German immigrants. Alleged, allegedly. These people were alleged German immigrants. So here's my question. Has anybody ever considered a retroactive lawsuit to sue the United States for not allowing us to be a part of the Homestead Act? And how would that look or how would that work? Because I think that that's something that people should look into. Like I said, as far as the quote unquote reparations and all of that goes, Man, it's so much stuff that we can get these. It's like it's so much stuff that we can get these people for. So much stuff. The list is an entire register tape full. And this is just a rabbit hole from a horror movie that I was watching. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that that that's even you could go down a whole horror movie rabbit hole like this. If you watch American Horror Story season three, the coven, where they talk about Marie Laveau. In Louisiana, you know what I'm saying? So now here it says upon claiming their land, the Bender family built a cabin which was used as a living quarters and a small general store. Although neighbors described John as a halfwit and called Elvira a she-devil, they were intrigued by Kate, who was a self-proclaimed psychic and spiritual healer. She was also the only member of her family who spoke fluent English. Crime reports, crime reads reports that the Bender family home also functioned as an inn where quote unquote settlers traveling along the great Osage trail were served meals and offered lodging. However, it eventually became the focus of an investigation into a number of grisly crimes. So again, what is this settling thing? Well, again, when they talk about this quote unquote settling, what is settling a deflection word for? Squatting. We're going to talk about squatting. 
I was I, I didn't plan on doing any streams today. You know what I'm saying? But I, I just really thought that this was extremely interesting and it would lead down other roads because, see, we've covered a lot of stuff just based on stuff from a horror movie. And I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but this topic of squatting is actually lit right now because it's a lot of interesting stuff going on with, quote unquote, squatting. Yeah, I, I agree. Shout out to Tammy. Tammy said, I believe the focus is only on slavery. The focus only on slavery is what keeps reparations being able to be tossed around like a hot potato. Yeah, that's one of the things. I, I wouldn't doubt that. I wouldn't doubt that at all. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, again, now, you know, no offense to anybody in here that's not FBA. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to all my people that's in here that's not FBA. No offense to y'all, right? But if people directly sued the United States government for being cut out of the Homestead Act, based on the time when your family first showed up on the census, that's one way where a specific non-race-based lawsuit could be filed against the United States for harms that they did against foundational Black Americans that people wouldn't be able to, to hop on. Because we got proof right here that white immigrants were able to participate in the Homestead Act. And first of all, we weren't immigrants. And second of all, we were not able to participate. You know what I'm saying? So now here it says, between, and then pay attention to these dates again, because we're not, they don't want us to talk about slavery, right? Don't talk about slavery. Why are you talking about slavery? How'd that affect anybody that's alive today? But these events have been used by Rob Zombie to make a fictional movie based on real life events that took place in the same days as slavery. So now the very people that are sitting up there telling you don't talk about this stuff is not happening. Don't worry about it. How does it affect anybody that's alive today? Making millions of dollars. They said that that movie House of a Thousand Corpse made $16 million. That might not be an overwhelming Hollywood success, but it's more money than, you know what I'm saying, most of us are making on a paycheck at our jobs or whatever we do in our daily life. But don't talk about it, though. Why not talk about it? We talking about it. You know what I'm saying? As the Great Osage Trail was heavily traveled by settlers, it was believed that they were abducted and ultimately deleted for their possessions. As reported by the Daily News, the entire Bender family abandoned their property and seemingly vanished amid the investigation of the crimes. Now, here goes my question. How did they just vanish? How do you just vanish into thin air is the question. How does that happen? You just poof, gone into thin air, just poof, poof gone. Out of here, they out of here, they gone. You know what I'm saying? Poof, gone, just poof, vanished in thin air. How did they not catch these people? But they can catch other people so easily. And real quick, shout out to everybody that's watching, man. I appreciate y'all. We got 50 people watching and we got 40 likes. If everybody could bang on that like button, if everybody could could hit that bell if you're not subscribed, and if everybody could share the stream to your social media and try to get us to... um try to get us to 80 likes, that'd be great. As reported by the Daily News, several neighbors entered the Benders Inn to investigate, and once inside, they noticed an unusual odor that seemed to be emanating from a trap door in the floor. The neighbors opened up the door and discovered a, ro a root cellar which was completely empty. However, the walls and floor of the cellar were reportedly covered in blood covered in whose blood a subsequent search of the benders land revealed 11 corpses buried on the property daily news reports 10 of the victims suffered blunt force trauma to the head and their throats had been slashed before they were buried in the nude the 11th victim who was estimated to be approximately seven years old did not appear to have any injuries and was found fully clothed authorities believe that the child was buried alive inside of her father's grave Officials believe that the Benders family worked together to abduct and delete victims. As Kate spoke fluent English, authorities believe she gained the victim's trust and lured them inside. They believe John Bender Sr. then bludgeoned the victims before slashing their throats and throwing their bodies into the root cellar 
to await burial. All right. By the time the bodies were found, the entire Bender uh, family had fled from the area. As reported by the Daily News, authorities and vigilante groups searched the entire region. However, the bloody Bender seemed to have vanished without any trace. Now, these people had accents. They looked funny. You know what I'm saying? How were they able to just vanish into thin air like this? See, that's the question that you got to ask, because that don't make any sense. And real quick, ladies and gentlemen, shout out to Patrick Taylor. Make sure y'all show Patrick some love. Please throw some flames, radiation emoji, and uh, ducks in the chat for Patrick. Patrick says, they'll just say everyone is dead from back then, but it was the U.S. government. But those people who made the decisions to lock out blacks are dead. Right. But the United States government and the Constitution, quote unquote, and the laws of the land, quote unquote, are allegedly right. Allegedly, allegedly a living document. Isn't that always how they describe the Constitution? Don't they describe the Constitution as a, quote unquote, living document? So if the Constitution is, quote unquote, living by their words, then guess what? We got somebody that we could slap a lawsuit on. Would y'all, if you guys agree, give me a thumbs up. If y'all disagree, give me a thumbs down. So now here it says, as reported by Crime Roads, it has been suggested that the man who called himself John Bender Sr. was actually a man named John Flickinger. Now, how did they figure this out? Who likely immigrated from Germany or the Netherlands. His wife, who called herself Elvira, was likely a woman named Elmira Mark, who was born and raised in the Adirondack. Adirondack Mountains, a family Bible, which was found inside the Bender Inn, identified John Jr. as a man named John Gebhardt. It is believed that Kate may have been Elvira's daughter from another marriage. However, neighbors said she and John behaved as though they were husband and wife. Now, that might have been part of the act. You know what I'm saying? That might have been part of the tricks that they was doing. But now here go the other tricks that they was doing. What's up with how many times they was changing their name? Facts and shout out to, to uh, Carlton. If y'all agree with Carlton, give me a thumbs up. If y'all disagree, give me a thumbs down. Carlton said, make sure we slap a lawsuit on those living corporations too. facts, because that's absolutely what a corporation is, is an artificial, eternal living person. You know what I'm saying? During the search for the bloody benders, authorities found that the family's horses abandoned approximately 12 miles away from the inn. Crime Reads reports that the horses remain the only tangible evidence of where the family fled after abandoning the farm. Although a number of vigilante groups claim they captured and deleted the Bloody Benders serial deleter family, they never produced any evidence to prove the claims. Other rumors suggest that the family fleed the country, changed their names, which is something they clearly were accustomed to, or were arrested for other crimes. In 1889, a mother and daughter were arrested on larceny charges in Michigan. Although the women expected of being Elvira and Kate Bender, the claims were never proved. Despite the fact that the bloody benders were never caught or punished for their crimes, crime reads report 12 other men were charged as accessories for redistributing items stolen from the victims. All right. So, yeah, man. That's that's kind of crazy. Nobody knows, nobody allegedly knows what happened to these people. My question to y'all is, what do y'all think happened to them? And what do y'all think about all of the goodies that the United States gave them? The United States gave them goodies that facilitated them being able to commit all of these crimes. Would you guys agree? What happened to this family of deleters? Well, one thing that we know that happened to that family of deleters is they got handouts from the American government. Handouts that we never received, but that people don't want us to talk about. Can't you just talk about something else? No. No. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No. It's the same way that Rob Zombie couldn't just make a movie about something else. No. You know what I'm saying? Crime has its bloody history, and many serial killers have roamed the earth in the past, leaving their blood spilled trail behind. Many infamous serial killers have committed dreadful, horrendous crimes that leave a chill in our spines today. But most killers, either through fear of capture or the need for privacy, work alone. 
few work with a partner, but for an entire family to operate this way is almost entirely unheard of. That's not true. Let me ask you guys this question. Is that true or not? That is absolutely true that these families work like this. You know what I'm saying? Real quick, shout out to Enoch Egbo. Enoch Egbo Simba. Appreciate you, bro, with the $2 super chat. Make sure y'all show Enoch Egbo Simba some love. Throw some flames, radiation emoji, ducks in the chat. He's the fourth stream sponsor. Definitely appreciate you. Shout out to Black Loki. Black Loki says, what was the race of the victims? Interestingly, they don't give the details. But I, I would not be shocked. I would not be shocked if many of the victims were black, especially given the time period and given the location of where all this stuff took place. You know what I'm saying? However, that is just what happened in the United States. In Kansas in the 1870s, the Bender family, immortalized as the bloody Benders, deleted over a dozen men in little more than a year. And then they suddenly vanished. Nobody knows where they went or what fate befell them. What could have happened to the bloody benders? So now here they're asking if this family was normal at first. There was nothing normal about the family. Nothing normal about the family. Nothing normal about the family structure. You know what I'm saying? The story of the bender family starts at the end of the American Civil War. Okay? So now let me ask you again, to conceptualize all this stuff, right? We got to ask the question, what do y'all think was going on? before like pre this time period we all know what was going on but if you talk about it now you know what i'm saying people are gonna say oh you're talking about woke history this is woke this is woke 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 you're talking about woke history you can't talk about all this stuff unless you talk about how good the united states is <laughs> when the osage native americans were moved look at this look this story of the Benders family starts with the end. Hold on real quick. Okay, here we go. This story of the Benders family starts with the end of the American Civil War when the Osage Native Americans were moved to Oklahoma under the Homestead Act. What is I I need you guys to explain that to me. What does that mean? How many people knew that the Osage Native Americans and who were they? They were moved to, quote unquote, Oklahoma under the Homestead Act. How is it that people were just being moved around who were already here? What do you mean they were, they were moved? They got two men in a truck and just decided to put them up in an Airbnb somewhere. Is that what ended up happening? How are you just, well, we're just, quote, unquote, we're just nicely placed here. You know what I'm saying? You see, you got a fork on this side. You got a knife on this side. You got a spoon on that side and a nice napkin just placed right in the middle. How is it that somebody is just, quote, unquote, placed? The Kansas region, look at this. The Kansas region was earmarked for European immigrants who wanted to settle and realize their great American dream. Undocumented bros, y'all. Now, let me ask you guys this question. Out of everybody in here that's watching, how many of you all's family had this opportunity to take advantage of this? If you, if your family or you had this opportunity to take advantage of this, then give me a thumbs up. If you guys didn't have no opportunity to take advantage of this or this was never offered to your family, then give me a thumbs down. And real quick, ladies and gentlemen, shout out to my man, AB Promotions. Make sure y'all show him some love, throw some flames, radiation emoji, and ducks in the chat from my man, AB Promotions with the 499 Super Chat. AB says, I think they changed their name. They do that all the time. Can y'all say sociopath and psychopath? Facts. So now here's the thing, right? What is the... you? They want to talk about, quote, unquote, writing a wrong. OK, go ahead. Write this one. Write this wrong. How is the United States going to write this wrong? Because they need to.
They need to. If you guys agree that the United States needs to right this wrong, give me a thumbs up. If y'all don't agree that the United States needs to right this wrong, then let me know what you feel needs to go on with this. Now, how does this now? If this region was earmarked for European immigrants, right, which was literally all the white people, how would we get any? How would we get any? This is OG lockout blockout. Now, let me ask you guys a question. Does this sound like hard work? Does this sound like Yankee ingenuity? If we're talking about Yankee ingenuity is creative ways of describing theft and extortion and redefining certain words to make it sound good, then sure, we can sit here and say that this is Yankee ingenuity all day long. Hard work and elbow grease is what they call it. <laughs> So now let me ask you guys this question. Would you all say that the Homestead Act is clearly one of the things directly responsible for attempting to put us in a position of being permanently in a place where we're not, quote unquote, able to catch up? Yeah, exactly. Shout out, shout out to shout out to Black Spider. Black Spider said, "Just Google the word bender, an object or person that bends something else." That's exactly what they did. Why did they choose that name? They was bending people up, and they were bending the truth. <laughs> shout out to Patrick Taylor. Patrick said, "That's in the past, and the past needs to stay in the past." Well, unless it's something that suits their vile interest in the past it's forevermore right like fourth of july right fourth of july was in 1776 and we shouldn't we shouldn't they still celebrate 1776 to this day but we shouldn't talk about stuff that took place in 1850 which 1850 is closer to current date than 1776 You know what I'm saying? So somebody makes so somebody makes sense of that. Somebody makes sense of it. You know what I'm saying? The Bender family of German descent was one of the families who moved to the outskirts of Kansas. The family, John and Elvira, and their two children, John Jr. and Kate, ultimately settled down near Cherryville City on a 160-acre property intending to run an end so again this is just that nonsense where you know what i'm saying just a hard-working immigrant you know what i'm saying who opened up a business opened up a couple of scalps you know what i'm saying in the process you know what i mean the german origin of the family was apparent from the way the men and women of the family talked John Bender Sr. and John Jr. were the first of the family to come to the property to create a small cabin. The men also converted the land into a sizable barn so that the women of the family could follow them and settle down. All right. According to accounts dating back to their time, the elder Bender was a relatively old man around 60 years of age. His son, John Bender Jr., was quite young, who was 25 years old. John Jr. was often referred to as a halfwit because he would laugh incessantly and without a reason, which he was actually probably laughing because of the sick, twisted stuff that he was thinking about planning on doing something sick and twisted and the person that he was about to do it to not not knowing about it. So that was that was comical and humorous to him. You know what I'm saying? So now here it says he could never speak fluent English with a German accent. John Sr., on the other hand, could not speak English well, which was natural for, quote unquote, senior German immigrants. Again, so we're dealing with the undocumented. We're dealing with OG undocumented bros. OK. OK, so they got a little uh, infographics channel video about this family. I don't really I'm I'm not really trying to mess with 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 that infographics channel 
you know what I'm saying? Because they might do some copyright stuff. You know what I'm saying? They've been they've been being real funny. They've been being real, real funny. You know what I'm saying? As far as like doing some weird stuff with my YouTube channel. And real quick, speaking of weird stuff, don't be weird. Hit that like button. But yeah, so I ain't trying to I ain't trying to touch that. Shout out to Solo T. What's good with it, bro? So now this is an article from the Smithsonian Magazine, right? The Kansas homestead where America's first serial deleter family committed his crimes is up for sale. Now, they were selling this property in February of 2020, right? Now, here goes my question. When they sold this homestead, where do y'all think that the money went to? And how was anybody able to sell it? The people just disappeared. The people just disappeared, right? So who got the money? Who took who took custody of this land after the Bender family just vanished into thin air? That's the question. Authorities recovered the bodies of up to 11 people from the Old West tract of land owned by the notorious Bloody Benders. And so, again, let me ask you guys this question. Would your family be able to benefit from the sale of land like this? If your family would be able to benefit from the sale of land like this, give me a thumbs up. If it wouldn't, then give me a thumbs down. And do y'all see how this blocks? We were effectively blocked out of this part of wealth building from the United States government. Like this is hardcore evidence of it right here. In the 1870s, a family of four allegedly, quote unquote, settled on the frontier prairie of the lands of southeastern Kansas, not far from the town of Cherryville. All right. So let's, I'm going to skip down here. Now it says the Bender Farm is listed as track two in a bundle of 15 properties heading to auction on February 11th. Now, mind you, again, this is old. Schrader. The Indiana-based real estate auction company facilitating the sale describes the 162-acre tract as containing some mature trees and a beautiful view overlooking the Drum Creek and the farmland bottoms below. All right. According to Amy Renee Leaker of the Wichita Eagle, the property's current owners purchased the land in the 1950s or 60s, long after souvenir seekers drawn in by glory, the glory tale had picked apart the original Bender homestead. It's strictly cropland, said Brent Wellings, Schrader's Southwest auction manager, tells the Eagle. He suspects that the property will continue to be used as farmland by its new owners, but notes that the upcoming sale of the property could provide a neat opportunity for somebody who's quote-unquote interested in quote-unquote that type of history. Now, again, they go down to further reinforce, right? The Benders were often described as a family of German descent, though little is known about them, and some researchers have questioned whether they were actually related. They arrived in Kansas after the southeastern part of the state had been, quote unquote, open to settlers. And this is according to the Kansas Historical Society. A historical marker set up near the Benders farm states that the younger Kate soon gained notoriety as a self proclaimed healer and spiritualist. So now, what here's my question what do they mean they arrived in kansas after the southeastern part of the state had been open to settlers D don't that sound like a sanctuary city that sounds like an og sanctuary city don't it shout out to my man ko kid fit what's good with it bro make sure y'all show ko kid fit some love throw some flames some radiation emojis some ducks in the chat for my man ko kid fit he said i don't don't get how whites feel so high and mighty with all these head start handouts facts and and on top of it they also forget that they're undocumented bros too shout out to mimi what's good with you mimi they forget that they're undoc or they forget that they're undocumented bros too you know what i'm saying they arrived in kansas after the southwest southeastern part of the state had been open to settlers does that sound like a does that sound like a sanctuary city?
If that sounds like a sanctuary city to you, then give me a thumbs up. If that don't sound like a sanctuary city to you, then give me a thumbs down. According to the Kansas Historical Society, a historical marker set up near the Bender Farm states that the younger Kate soon gained notoriety as a self-proclaimed healer and spiritualist. A canvas curtain divided the family's home into two sections, yada, yada, yada. We read all that. We read all that. So then they just they go on to just talk more about the history of the. Uh, of the family, which we already went into. All right. So. Again, it's just wild. That they got all this land through the Homestead Act. There's another article um, from Slate that talks a little bit about this. We're going to just skim through this article real quick. All right. The story of the bloody benders. So this right here, the, the benders, the benders are a OG immigrant German family that received massive amounts of handouts and now have been immortalized in a fictional, in a fictional trilogy of movies based on a fictional town in Texas called Ruggsville. In the movie called House of a Thousand Corpse, that was written by Rob Zombie, where he made $16 million off of that movie. And then when you go back and search and look at all of the little pieces of that movie, you can link damn near each piece of that movie to some type of historic injustice. Whether it's being locked out, blocked out, whether it's the Homestead Act. Whether it's the Lagorne family of Texas in Dead in Deadwood, you know what I'm saying? Now, my question for you guys is, why is it that they don't talk about this? Why is it that they don't want us talking about this? How do how do people just come up with and make up so many lies and act like none of this stuff, none of this stuff is real. None of this stuff applies. Don't talk about it because we don't want you guys talking about it. Let me ask you guys this question. Why do you think that they don't want people talking about it? See, that's 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 where that right there is the question that people really need to ask. And shout out to everybody watching. We got 59 people watching and we got 51 likes. If everybody could bang on that like button and get us to 90, that'd be great. Yeah, facts. Shout out to Finally Aware. Finally Aware said, because it's true. Facts. Facts. Now, Jesse Lee Peterson said he wanted some W history. Here goes some good W history for you. You know what I'm saying? Story of the Bloody Benders. Now, let me ask you guys this. How many of y'all could find a comparable story about us to this? I'm sure there's some because, you know, there's everybody out of everybody ain't the best. However, there's a disproportionately large amount of stories like this when it comes to them peeps over there. There's a disproportionately large amount of stories like this when it comes to quote unquote them folks over there. You know what I'm saying? Now, look at what this says down here. This is interesting. This is an interesting ser uh, sentence. This was just the kind of crime that the frontier made possible. So, now let me ask you guys this question Who's responsible for them having a quote unquote frontier? Somebody gave them a frontier. They didn't just randomly have a front. Actually, they did kind of just randomly get one. But how did they just randomly get a frontier? How'd they just randomly get a frontier? Because that happened. They just randomly got a frontier. How'd it happen? The story of the Bloody Benders, the serial killing family that terrorized the Wild West and then poof. Disappeared. There's a picture of them right here.
On October 22nd of 1889, a strange trial got underway in the town of Niles, Michigan. All right, so then of course, this is what we're talking about here, talking about that uh, mother and daughter pair. So there's a book about them called Hell's Half Acre, The Untold Story of the Benders, a serial killer family on the quote unquote American frontier. And again, this is a German immigrant family that was given about 160 acres of land. All right, here, right here. This is what we're looking for right here. The older man spoke very little and mostly in German. Gerbhardt talked incessantly, making it clear that they were looking for a claim. As per the Homestead Act, any federally surveyed plot of land was available to settlers willing to live on it and develop. These plots were called claims. How? Like, make that make sense. Look at this. Look at this. They go into the immigrant history. They materialized seemingly out of nowhere, committed horrific and immeasurable acts of brutal violence, and then seemed to simply vanish. Nationally notorious, their deeds intertwined with the founding narratives of the American West, a place where Anglo settlers saw a future rich with possibility, with few strictures related to class, family background, or law to hinder them. Having plundered this land from its original inhabitants, the American government turned it over to thousands of poor immigrants who sought to make their names and fortunes on stolen land. Some people found the American dream. Some people found poverty. And at least 11 people, probably more, found death at the hands of the Bender family. As expertly told in Susan Jonas's new book, Hell's Half acre the untold story of the benders a serial killer on the american frontier the saga of the benders began in october of 1870 when two men whom identified themselves as john gerbhardt and john bender arrived in osage township in the southeast corner of kansas they seemed related either through blood or marriage though neither man ever elaborated on this they divulged nothing of their past again people just showing up out of nowhere the older man spoke very little and mostly in German. Gerbhardt talked incessantly, making it clear that they were looking for a claim. As per the Homestead Act, any federally surveyed plot of land was available to settlers willing to live on it, develop it, and these plots were called claims. The Benders built a small one-room cabin among, along a creek in Labatt County, the two men having been joined by John Bender's wife, Ma Bender, and their daughter, Kate. For a few years in their home, they operated it as a way station for travelers on the sparse, desolate stretch of land. In addition, Kate advertised herself as a spirit medium. All right. So, again, they got all of this. They, they got all this land just basically for free. All right. And again, th they detail it here in this article from Slate. So now these are three different sources where we detail all these free handouts that these people got. So when it comes to Lagorn, the Lagorn family, when it comes to Deadwood, Texas, when it comes to House of a Thousand Corpses, and when it comes to the Bender family, my question is, how many of you all can compare your family history to those people and say that America has offered me the exact same opportunity as them. And my question is, if there's a whole group of people here in the United States who already had those opportunities available to them, and we're now in 2024, where the United States is annexing Black American cities for the new Homestead Act 2.0 for the undocumented bros, my question is, what do you call that? See, that's the question right there. What do you call that? All of that rabbit hole just came from me posted on the couch watching the House of a Thousand Corpses. 
You know what I'm saying? So real quick, ladies and gentlemen, shout out to everybody that's watching. I appreciate y'all. Shout out to my man, New York State of Mind with the $5 Super Chat. Shout out to uh, my man, AB Promotions with the $199 Super Chat. Shout out to Patrick Taylor with the $499 Super Chat. Shout out to Enoch with the $2 Super Chat. Definitely appreciate it. Shout out to AB again with the $4.99. Definitely appreciate it, bro. And shout out to my man, KO Kid Fit, all right? And I plan on uh, doing a couple more live streams. So make sure if you guys are not subscribed to the channel, hit the bell. If you're not part of the Discord, hit the link that's in the chat. I think, um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what time, but y'all will, uh, will see the notifications and y'all will get the notification if y'all in the Discord. Hashtag replay gang, if you're watching on the replay, let me know what y'all think about this. Shout out to my man, DC Precise. Let me know what y'all think about this. Let me know what y'all think about the topic that was discussed. This ain't, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not no trending news or not anything that's really being talked about, but I think that this is interesting. And the thing is, is that if you focus on a little piece of everything in the United States, you will be able to see somehow that it's traced back to anti-blackness now here go the thing right to all these people that say that none of this stuff exists like 50 cent and mob deep said debunk that <laughs> niggas try to sit on my stream and if you don't believe me then do your research and bump that go ahead and debunk that <laughs> And as always, ladies and gentlemen, 